Hello and welcome to Popcorn Mumbles, the podcast where we dig into the back catalog to select a film or television show to rewatch. I'm your host, Cody Nestor. Alongside me is my co-host, Todd Heal. What's going on, guys? This week, we've chosen the 1965 film Thunderball. Led by one-eyed evil mastermind Emilio Largo, the terrorist group Spectre hijacks two warheads from a NATO plane and threatens widespread nuclear destruction to extort 100 million pounds. The dashing agent 007, James Bond, is sent to recover the warheads from the heart of Largo's lair in the Bahamas, facing underwater attacks from sharks and men alike. He must also convince the enchanting Domino, Largo's mistress, to become a key ally. Thunderball was released on December 22, 1965. On a budget of $9 million, it made $141 million. It has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 85% and an audience score of 73%. So, Todd, let's discuss Thunderball. Spoilers are ahead. So, Todd, first question up to you here. Uh, what is James Bond up to in our pre-title sequence here? So, in our pre-title sequence, we kind of see him. He's at a funeral. Uh, he's kind of up on a balcony looking down. There's kind of a, just a random like female agent with him, field agent. Uh, make, she makes Mademoiselle com- Laporta. Yes. Uh, she kind of makes a comment about the casket having his initials on it, JB. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When it was first started, I was I was kind of confusing it and you only live twice for a second. Right. I was like, wait a minute. I thought it was you only live twice where they have his fake Bond funeral. But no, just the initials on a casket. So we kind of see a little bit of a procession walking up to view the casket. We see a widow with the black veil. Uh, she kind of pays her respects. She walks back out. Uh, Bond and the lady walk back out on the ledge, kind of watch him get into a car, and he's ready to take off. He's got to. He's got to go. Yeah, he uh, <laughs> he he notices uh, the uh, um, the widow. The thing that he kind of points out to him that to, to take note of, he notices the widow opens the, her own car door yeah. for herself. A little kinda, sus. Hmm, <laughs> kind of sus. And then we see Bond later back in, uh, I guess it would be Colonel Bouvard's uh, estate, something like, like estate. Yeah. yeah. And what happens from there, Todd? So uh, they walk in. Uh, we see uh, James is already in there. He's sitting in a chair. He gets up, walks towards the lady, and just decks her right in the face. Just yeah. Pow. We talked about last <laughs> week. Uh, there's not as much for sure, but we talked about last week. Uh, those, like, if you put a, together a James Bond compilation, this film has a couple, and him right. punching a lady. Uh, That's one uh, of them. <laughs> uh, dressed in uh, a widow's garb yeah. and, and funeral garb. That's that's definitely one of them. So him and uh, who we find out that the uh, the widow is none other than Colonel Bouvard himself. Went to his own funeral and faked his own death. And him and Bond have a little uh, fight in Bouvard's kind of office study, whatever you want to call it there. Nice little skirmish, I thought. It is. Uh, did, I, I noticed that at one point Bouvard grabs a uh, like a fire poker. Yeah. Uh, and it's very rubber. <laughs> it's very rubber. I'll try to find the clip and put it in here, but okay. yeah, it's very, it's very rubber. He, he hits Bond with it a couple of times, and there's no reaction from Sean Connery. Yeah, and there's a couple of times he whips it back and forth. You could tell it's very much like a licorice stick. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so continue on, uh, finish up our uh, our pre-credits uh, sequence. So uh, Bond uh, polishes off this guy. Uh, uh, some of his, uh, I guess, uh, goons start making their way into the room. Uh, James takes time to pause and throw some flowers on his dead body. <laughs> yeah. Uh, makes his way upstairs and outside and straps on his jet pack, baby. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, the jet pack. So something we, we kind of, we joked about it before the podcast, and it's something I had here in my notes is like, can you explain how that jet pack got up there, Todd? You know, I was I was really sitting here getting ready to rip this scene a whole new asshole because how does that jet pack get up there? And the only thing I can figure is... He obviously beats them back to the compound. Does he just strap it on and fly up there and access it that way? That's the only thing I can figure. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's still a hard sale, though. Right. You would think Bovar's people or someone would still be around that estate. I was thinking the to same see thing. see a guy fly up there. Yeah. <laughs> is, that a, is that a British secret agent in a jetpack? <laughs> couldn't, couldn't be. Uh, but, yeah, it's like... Yeah, I I think if if within the 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 narrative of the field, that's the only thing you could think of. But I think it was just, hey, we need this. We got this jetpack. We got this guy we that need can to fly. Work his, yeah, 
can we just get this in the scene somehow? It doesn't really fit anywhere else. How about uh, you know, Jimmy straps it on and gets out of Bouvard's, you know, castle with with this right. thing. But yeah, that that's kind of what I was thinking. Like the only only narrative uh, way that I could reconcile it is that he beats them there. But still, he either has to haul that jetpack all the way up through that <laughs> castle from the bottom floor, or he has to fly it up there and not be not be seen. It's a tough sell, Ty. It's, it's like they must sell. have stopped up and, you know, ate, had something to watch the movie. <laughs> yeah, they got some a bucket of Colonel's chicken right. or something because, yeah, they, they took their time if he was able to, like, either do either of those things. Right. Really. Uh, so we talked a little bit last week, uh, you know, Goldfinger. We, we covered it. We obviously both love it. We both think it's, you know, I think you classified as your favorite Bond film. It's my second favorite behind, like, Casino Royale. But um, we talked about the... We're starting to get the fall off. Right. After Goldfinger, it kind of, it's diminishing returns. We start to go downhill. I think you made the comment just a little bit ago before we started filming that this is the last probably great Connery. True. And this is not, there is definitely a fall off here. Yeah, I will agree. Yes. There's definitely a fall off, and it definitely kind of feels different than the other three Bond films, which we'll kind of maybe talk about as we go through. But I, there's definitely a drop off from Goldfinger to Thunderball, but it, it's not as big as I remember it being. I've yeah. probably seen this one of all the Conneries probably the least. Right. Like of all of them, it's the one I go back to the least. Like, you know, things like You Only Live Twice and Diamonds Are Forever, they have that kind of. I don't know that bad. It's good quality to them, <laughs> right? Like this, right. you know, Blofeld and Drag and <laughs> Jimmy Dean, sausage purveyor running around. You know what I mean? Like it's Bond got the, passing his Japanese. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I can't wait till we get there. <laughs> But yeah, it's it, it has those kind of like really bad, so bad it's good type stuff. But this is still pretty solid. But it's got it's got problems. So what's what's Jimmy Bond actually up to this time? What's the assignment here? So uh, basically, as you kind of mentioned in our open, uh, Spectre has this uh, brand new scheme. They're going to uh, hijack a plane uh, that's carrying two nuclear warheads. Uh, they actually fly it down to Nassau down in the Bahamas unload said warheads and are going to hold i think the u.s and and, and england for ransom right uh, the, if they don't meet their demands they're going to maybe detonate that one of those warheads in a major city yeah and we see um one, one of the things i do one of the scenes i really like in this film is like we see that kind of the we get a little bit more of the inner workings of specter we get like right. that like conference room scene we and uh you get kind of blowfeld who's still kind of shrouded he still hasn't put a we haven't put a face or an actor to uh to the name yet but we kind of get that scene where he's kind of like having his meeting with his cronies and they're kind of reporting in on i guess this week's takings and yeah. earnings and then right. he knows one of the uh one of the two guys has shorted him and we get like the electric chair scene <laughs> Yeah, straight out of uh, the Austin Powers parody yeah. that would come years later. <laughs> yeah. Here's what we're referencing here in Thunderball. Uh, but I do enjoy like kind of getting a little bit more behind the scenes of, of Spectre, like you know, kind of seeing some of how that actually works and giving it a little bit more life than just ooh, it's this big evil organization. But like actually seeing like some of the inner workings of it was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, really, this assignment Bond just that's one of my kind of my problems with it a little bit is that Bond just lucks into this assignment. Yeah. Assignment. Just some things kind of have to be happening at the same place he happens to be staying. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we see him kind of on, uh, he's on a respite kind of, I guess in almost in a way, a kind of a rehabilitation a little bit because we see his he's got a, a bruise on his side from getting hit with that rubber fire poker. Right. <laughs> and he's uh, down also, I guess, somewhere, I guess he's in the Bahamas. Is he in the Bahamas at that point? No, he's not in the Bahamas at that point. He's, I think it was kind of like, like you said, like some kind of a... Uh, Retraining yeah, facility, yeah, spa. Just some kind of retreat, yeah, basically. I think they called it Scrublins. <laughs> what what a name, Scrublins. Uh, but, yeah, he's down there, and he's just doing some R&R, &R and he happens to, like, really just stumble across this this plot pretty much and just kind of tumble into the uh, the assignment this time. So yeah. uh, let's talk about some of the stuff that goes on at uh, Scrublins. <laughs> um, he's got a kind of a... Uh, what will we call her? She's she's another one of our Bond girls in a way. Patricia Fearing, she's kind of his, uh, I guess, aide there. Yeah, she's, kind of maybe a personal masseuse. Aide. Yeah, exactly. She <laughs> she's kind of working with him. Uh, do you like when she like straps into that milking table? 
<laughs> but yeah, basically, uh, who's our players here? We kind of see of another scene of like a pilot, and I forget his name right off. Do you remember his name? Uh, was that the one that was uh, Domino's brother? Yes. Uh, Francois Duval. So we, we see him, and he is with uh, this red-headed uh, uh, lady called Fiona. Right. And they basically, they set up a plot to... Uh, he is one of the uh, the pilots that's going to be set up in that test plane with the two, you know, atomic bombs, basically that they that Spectre wants to take. So they got to get him out of commission. So they take care of him and they replace him with Count Lippy. Allow me to correct my mistake here. Count Lippy actually recruits Angelo Palazzi to oversee the theft of the bombs, and it's Palazzi that surgically alters his face to match that of French Air Force pilot Francois Derval. So, yeah, we got this one wrong, but I say we blame Todd. I think he got the point. So, actually, uh, we get back into uh, MI6, back into England, and uh, I love this scene where they're kind of in, like, that war room, like, prep room. The conference room is overkill. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, <laughs> but I'm like, yeah. Jesus. And we see all the double O's. You like see this. all other agents, yeah. which was awesome, and I thought it was really cool that the – code name for this mission 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 actually is thunderball right so i thought that was neat that the name of the movie is actually the code name of the mission this right time. That, that was cool. awesome um so what uh where do we go from our conference room like where, where where's our assignment for 007 so i think initially uh ian was going to send him to alaska canada yeah canada, canada i'm sorry yeah, yeah and uh bond's like well you know i've I recognize this girl in this photo. Uh, she's with uh, Duval. That was her brother. I'm making work an angle down there with her in Nassau. I think I need to go to Nassau. So that's where he goes, baby. All these, <laughs> most of these films need to go to Nassau or the Bahamas. Is it? Is it just so every, the people behind the production have somewhere nice to film? Yeah, James never goes to the Arctic Circle no. or, or the Amazon jungle. No, or nothing no, like no. That. He it's, goes uh, very, uh, very tourist friendly, very, uh, very uh, scenic uh, yeah, places. Five star hotels all the way. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, continue, sorry, Todd. So he does wind up down in Nassau. Uh, he has a agent down there helping him, a female agent by the name of, I think her name Paula, was Paula. Paula yes. Kaplan. And uh, we, we kind of see Domino. We see our, our first glimpse of her. She's kind of out on the boat, and her and James have a little Wasn't she play. riding a fish first, or a, a turtle? Yeah, what, oh yeah, yeah. What, what she, I she was, was like, I was like, hey, I was like, hey, he's going hey, to catch a ride on the back of a turtle. Yeah, it was did, the you, 60s. did you get consent from that turtle? <laughs> yeah. Turtles, ha- no, I'm never right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she said, yeah, we see her first. She's riding a turtle. So her and James kind of have a little meeting there, and, uh, you know, he gets back on the boat with Paula, but, you know, they kind of fake some kind of boat trouble so Bond can get a ride back to the mainland with uh, Domino. Yeah, exactly. And uh, let, let's go ahead and uh, let's get into some of the stuff. Uh, we'll maybe go a little bit ahead, but we do see we see Island Q. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's that's what I call him. It, Q is uh, is there to right. equip 007 in the field. He's got his uh, his Tommy Bahama shirt on. It's <laughs> it's Island Q all the way. So let, let, uh, some of the cars, the gadgets, watches, and weapons we get in this film. So of course the Aston Martin comes back. Briefly, but it is back. It is back. I do like it. It has some of the same kind of holdovers from Goldfinger. You like the uh, kind of the bulletproof shield that comes through in the back. Right. I think uh, we see in the uh, the opening credits, um, it has like water squirters <laughs> out the back. <laughs> it's that, either spraying water or he's just spraying oil, the oil slick stuff on them guys. Yeah. I couldn't figure it. I can't figure it, it out. You, might, you stuff. might be right. <laughs> but it cuts into our watery Thunderball right. opening, opening credits there. Uh Thunderball opening credits. Let's segue to that. Where does that rank in the four Bond films we've got? Uh, I would probably put them probably right after Goldfinger. I really like these opening credits, and I like the song. Yeah, I would say um, probably Goldfinger, Dr. No, This, and then From Russia would be my bottom. Right. I just give Dr. No just because it's like the classic. Oh, yeah, James definitely, Bond. yeah, yeah. Uh, rest of the gadgets, we have uh, the jetpack, of course. Yep. We have uh, Largo's cigarette case remote control. <laughs> that is the worst place secret door I've ever seen. It's through like a, almost like a swinging saloon door, ain't it? <laughs> and it's just in the next room. Right. He's like, there's all these people. It's like, I don't know, almost like an insurance office or something. Yeah. They're just like, they're, uh, Mr. Largo, oh, did you just dis- disappear into this secret door right behind this other room? Like, <laughs> it's the worst place secret door I've ever seen. Uh, Blofeld's control panel, of course, we have him where he can electrify and kill people. Uh, there's a scene um, 
it's there's not any real there's no real car stuff in this film. The only thing is at one point Bond is being tailed, I guess, away from Scrublands, and I guess it's Fiona. Oh, the rocket firing motorcycle. Yeah, the motor, yes. the motorbike torpedo that never reappears because she just ditches it she in did. the water. She like it's like one of the cooler uh, the Bond. Uh, you know, vehicles, gadgets, or whatever yeah. the the motorbike with a torpedo. She destroys the other car behind Bond, and then just ditches the bike in the water. I was like, "You don't need that, lady." I mean, she's pretty cool. That's too cold, ha- too cool to get rid of. Had right to there. be pretty expensive. <laughs> uh, we get a tape recorder and a dictionary. Ah, yeah. Uh, we get a Geiger counter in the watch. Uh, right. Bond's watch is a it's a heavily modified uh, Bretling Top Time. Uh, we also get an infrared camera with a Geiger counter. We get James Bond's rebreather. And we get his radioactive homing peel that nice. he'll eventually uh, he'll eventually swallow uh, once stranded later on in the film. Um, we've kind of touched on some of the plot and some of the gadgets and stuff here. Well, I'll go ahead and ask you this, Ty. Like, since we're a little bit into into the plot, so why doesn't Thunderball work as well as Doctor No or Goldfinger? I th- I think for me, it may be because it's getting maybe a little too gadgety. And it's a lot of these specific type scene, you need this for this type gadgets. Maybe I'm reading it wrong, but. <laughs> no, I mean, you mentioned last week, like we were starting to get into like less spy and we're getting into more super, super spy, spy. And I think that is a big problem. It just, there's something about it that feels off and different than the other three that came before it. Guy Hamilton's, he was in for Goldfinger, makes arguably the best Bond film of all time, and he's out. Terrence Young is back, who directed the first two Bond films, which were also fantastic. But there's something about this that just feels... Seems a little different than the other three. Yeah, and it's like I think Connery looks a little different. I don't think it's like an age thing. Like it's, I think they did something with the toupee. Right. It's very flat. <laughs> Right. It's like very flat yeah. and like I don't know, there's just something about it that's off. There's like a lot of good things and there's some good visuals, but there's something I think tonally and I think maybe how things kind of come narratively with him just kind of stumbling across everything, it just doesn't come across as well. Like the scrubbling stuff, it does end up being kind of there's a couple of good things, but it is kind of like I don't know. It's kind of like corny in a way. Right. I don't. I don't even know how to how to describe it. But there's just something off about. Um, you know, uh, we still get some of the the things we come to expect from Jimmy Bond now. Uh, more sexual assault. Right. Back, back <laughs> right. at Scrublands, I right. forgot to mention that he uh, he uh, forces himself upon Patricia. Uh, she kind of rejects him, and then after he's uh, almost dies on the milking table, he uses his blackmail against right. her. So right. we've gone from sexual assault to blackmail, pretty <laughs> much here. Uh, you know, so it's just. I mean, overall, it's still pretty solid, but I mean, there there's. There's something about it that I can't quite place my my finger on in, ter- in terms of why it doesn't feel like some of the other Bond films that yeah, kind of yeah. came before it. Anyway, Todd, take us uh, on through and uh, our, our assignment and our plot here. So uh, basically, uh, Bond uh, goes to uh, I think it's like an onshore casino, and mm-hmm. I think he has his first face to face with Largo. Uh, that he has that classic line where I think he beats him one round. And he's like, I I see that certain specter at your shoulder. Yeah, he's like. Uh, specter of defeat. Yeah, <laughs> not the big ass ring you wear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, not that you're a specter agent. No, no, no. So he's that. continuing to try to, uh, you know, kind of win over Domino, trying to get her help and trying to locate, you know, where these warheads are at. Uh, we also get our old pal Felix Leiter, played by another actor again. Yeah, <laughs> there, Felix has Felix ever been the same actor in any of the films? Uh, Jeffrey Wright, and there's also a guy that. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he played him in *Live and Let Die*, and then again in *License to Kill*. Okay, but in these early, in these four, in the first four, he's never been the same guy. He's never right? been the same guy Jesus. twice. Uh-uh. <laughs> Jesus. Anyway, <laughs> so Bond and Felix are also trying to you know they're taking up helicopters. They're trying to look trying to locate that plane anywhere in the water they can spot it. They're having no luck. Yeah, the actual uh, the stealing of the plane and like uh, covering it and stuff underwater, all that stuff's really good. Like some really really like strong stuff. Yeah, like it's good. we get a lot of obviously we get a lot of underwater stuff. We'll talk about the the big underwater fight scene later. But like that that whole kind of scene of stealing the actual plane and like you know tr- going into the water. They the dude Sully selling burgers it onto the onto the water <laughs> and they take it down. They cover it. Oh, that's pretty good yeah. stuff. 
So uh, Bond actually has a, uh, I think it was a Sunday dinner at uh, Palmyra, which mm. is uh, Largo's little ranch right there on the island. Uh, we see he has an affinity for sharks. He keeps a pool full of sharks. Yeah, Golden Grotto sharks yeah, is what he right. calls them. I was looking it up or whatever, and they're like, it, there's no like specific kind of like genus of shark that live in the Golden Grotto that are supposed to be more aggressive. They're just the native uh, whatever shark species are in the Golden Grotto or whatever I was looking up last night. And so uh, Bond also has a close call after he has his uh, gets his new equipment from Q. He's trying to he's underwater trying to get close to the Disco Volante, uh, trying to figure out if those warheads are on are inside the boat. Uh, they kind of discover him, start uh, dropping grenades into the water. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then we don't really have a uh, like Goldfinger. We don't really have a, a sub boss or a heavy. I guess or like a like I guess the closest thing to it is like a, an odd job would be Vargas. Right, it yeah. w- and he's nowhere near like an odd, odd no. job. He's like he's just he's like your sort of your mini boss, but there's not really an odd job or a Jaws or that type character in this film. He just gets kind of you know goons. Yeah. It's just like random specter goons, right. really. Uh, let's see here. So, really, the the crux of it to kind of I guess go forward a little bit in the plot. I mean, really. Uh, the big kind of third act, bef- well, before we get to the third act, it's really about trying to figure out where those bombs are. Right. Like you mentioned the Disco Volante, which is Largo's ship, and it's about trying to figure out, our because they're it's a, a ticking clock scenario. They've got so many hours. Yeah. Spectre is ransoming this to uh, the UK and the United States. They want the 100 million pounds, or they're going to detonate it. So there's a ticking clock element, and... It's basically bonds you have to find and locate these bombs before, you know, the zero hour before we have to pay this money because we have, like, no other kind of choice. And so uh, they do end up finding the bombs when, I guess, Bond, he kind of infiltrates Largo's, I guess, little uh, underwater team that go to, like, kind of retrieve the bombs. Yeah, I think Domino had kind of told him that, you know, right there near Palmyra, there was kind of like an underground, like, kind of a— cavern with you can access by steps kind mm-hmm. of a waterway yeah so he kind of he kind of waits for uh he kind of waits there and he kind of infiltrates uh, largo's team a little bit and they go down and actually see the bombs and they start to kind of recover them and take them back aboard the disco volante because they've kind of like stashed them somewhere else uh bond is kind of discovered underwater yeah it's really kind of clunky like right. it's really it's really hard to read sometimes underwater like but like he's discovered and that's where he gets left kind of uh he escapes and he gets kind of left in they pin him into the little uh it's like a makeshift kind of they've kind of cordoned off some type of cavern like and like able to like shut it off and he gets kind of left there and that's where we uh we get the use of the radioactive peel yeah swallows the peel so he'll show up so they can track him exactly so felix and uh some other guy and some of the pilot kind of come to his rescue they pull him out of there uh some of the the equipment that i didn't mention that comes into a factor is like i guess it's a water propulsion device of some sort you know what I'm talking about? That Bond has strapped to his back in our third act. Oh, and he comes flying, flying in. in. Exactly. Wow. It's, it's like leaving some kind of yellow stuff behind it in its way. Right. It shoots, you know, its own harpoons. It's got a big spotlight. Yeah, exactly. It's like <laughs> you see him fiddling with it in like... You know, when Island Q shows up, he's, yeah. like, kind of messing around with it, and Q keeps chastising to, like, leave it alone. But, yeah, basically, um, once Bond locates the, the bombs, it's about basically stopping him and reclaiming the bombs. And so that that's basically our third act is this big, huge kind of underwater set piece. Um, and... Bond is dropped out of uh, the Coast Guard, uh, the Coast Guard helicopter with his little water jetpack. Right, another little jetpack. And the other water scene. I mean, I was thinking about it. Like for 1964, 65. I mean, the the logistics of it. It's a pretty impressive scene. It's filmed really well. Like it, it, it's it, good. It goes on like it, it's it's a good lengthy scene. There's a lot of like. Not only is it, it's not just Bond, it's a lot of Spectre goons. It's a lot of, like, I guess they would be there. Uh, I guess they would be from the U.S. because they're, like, right on the coast of Miami. Like, the Coast Guard drops a bunch of, like, U.S., like, kind of military right. or agents or divers down. So there's, like, this big underwater third act fight. And it's really good, but it doesn't, it still doesn't live up to some of the stuff we've seen before. Right. It's no Red Grant train fight. Yeah, I mean, underwater fights is kind of, I mean, they're difficult to pull off. Yeah. Not <laughs> they they of, do it good here, but it's just kind of difficult to make it seem, I guess, 
really like a, 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 a big battle, you know what I'm saying? Because it's underwater. Yeah. The movements are kind of limited. What you can do is kind of limited. I mean, don't get me wrong. It works here, and it looks great. But. Yeah, exactly. It's it's just, like I said, it, it is, it's, it's good. It's just, like I said, it's no Red Grant. It's no... Bond versus Odd Job, like there's, it's not, it's not as good as those, but I mean, technically impressive. It's probably as, as far as these early Bond films go. Like I can't really think of a more, I guess, technically impressive scene than like putting right. all that together. Like this film has a nine million dollar budget, which I think is like, a, like more than the first three combined. budgets combined. Right. Yeah, exactly. So they obviously put a lot of money into it, and I was reading too. It seemed like that uh, they had to. Uh, actually kind of extend the release date window of this film to kind of accommodate some of the editing of it. Like, it, I think the director, someone said they needed more time to, like, actually edit it properly, like, to get it where it needed to be. And I, I would assume most of that kind of comes from, like, the, the third act here yeah. uh, as we go through. But, I mean, there's some good stuff. There's some uh, underwater harpooning, a lot of knife stabbing. Everybody's got that same blue knife. Right. <laughs> Everybody is all outfitted from the same, you know, equipment company or equipment yeah. store. Everybody's got the same. Same, except for Bond has a blue diving mask and everyone else has black diving masks. But you got to be able to tell your hero. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And like, but yeah, everybody's got the same basic like harpoon equipment and uh, got that same blue knife. I noticed you getting blood in the water. Sharks are starting to show up. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. So take us through our last uh, our last little uh, part here with uh, the Disco Volante. So uh, Largo and Bond and uh, I think Domino is still on board the Disco Volante, uh, mm -hmm. but. Uh, uh, Largo and Bond make their way back up onto the ship. Uh, we get to see that the Disco Volante is, it separates. It yeah, has like has a, a, a back hole section that can just dump and leave. And I guess it's kind of like a hydrofoil in the front. Right. And uh, so it takes off. Uh, it leaves the back shell to kind of, you know, fend for itself. Coast Guard kind of blows it to bits. And then we get what's maybe to me probably my favorite scene in the whole movie is that close quarters fight on the the bridge of that disco volante the hydrofoil it's bond and largo back and forth uh, they got to take turns getting the ship back right so it don't hit the rocks <laughs> yeah uh yeah that that scene uh that's where i feel like it's a little lower let down for me yeah. like i that's where this is really no bond versus odd job yeah I, it's the fastest boat i've ever seen <laughs> It's like, moving on. It's it? moving on like those same like repeated rear projection, yeah. uh, front projection, whatever you want to call it. It's like repeated like yeah. several times of right. like almost hitting that same island, and someone's got to <laughs> turn the wheel. Yeah, it's. I don't. I'm very conflicted about that I scene. Honestly, it's just something I've always loved about that part. I don't know. Maybe it is kind of that. Little I bit guess of they a, needed something yeah. simple after. Right. And it's just really like in the a small little. It's just a close quarters kind of, you know, not nowhere near as good, but kind of like the Red Grant Bond fight. There's just a small close quarters battle with Largo at Bond. I think maybe it was there's, one other. There's a lot of kicking people, right. random goons down the steps, yeah. just trying to come up. It's kind of fast paced. Yeah. Domino ends up uh, dispatching Largo with uh, with a harpoon. Harpoon gun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not saying it's bad, but it ain't no. It's no odd job and Jimmy, and it's no Red Grant, and it's not. It doesn't right. live up to some of those. It's not even a. I wouldn't even say it's as good as like an end of like a Doctor No, which is not even true, really a fight, true. but. Yeah, it it uh, it has its charm, I guess you would say. Maybe but it's like, a guilty pleasure. I, I think I it. Know. I think it might be one of those guilty pleasures right. because I'm like, uh, I was kind of that thinking. I'm like, this is the ending. Like, I don't remember <laughs> this. The real, the actual, actual last thing is we kind of see Bond and Domino. They're kind of out to sea because Jimmy's always out to sea with the the love interest. Right. Uh, just a, he's he's afloat in the in the ocean in a couple of these films at the end with the love interest and they're kind of uh, pulled out of the water with like a, the Fulton system like kind of like the CIA Fulton system right. kind of like a from a the blue, dark night from the dark night exactly <laughs> exactly uh, they stole this from the dark night of course <laughs> everyone knows this and they're kind of Fultoned out of the water and I think doesn't like the thing says like when two arrows meet or something like that or it has some kind of saying oh on yeah it was something on when it, arrows yeah. meet is when what it says meet, and yeah. he, they're kind of faulted and just yoinked out of the water and i was like that's kind of weird also yeah i was thought i originally when i first saw this i was thinking well they're just going to kind of tow them back on that raft that's what i thought yeah that's the simple thing but then they just get hoisted out and they're just kind of dangling at the back of the plane when do they get reeled up when yeah. they land somewhere eventually they just drag them across the pavement of the airport <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah, I was like, that's a little weird. I was like, why not just pick them up in the Coast Guard ship or like you said. Just, yeah. Yeah, again, it's kind of weird, and it's one of those things, like, I feel like a lot of this movie is like, well, we got the money. Exactly. We got the budget. Let's do this. Let's do this. Yeah. Let's let's yank Jimmy Bond out with a plane at the end for no reason. Right. Let's give him a jetpack at the beginning for no reason. Right. Let's have this big underwater fight because uh, we can. We can, yeah. We can. We got the money for it. We got $9 million compared to everything else we've done before. Uh, just going back through my notes here, some things I just a couple things I wanted to point out. Another classic iconic Bond scene in line is uh, Bond dispatching Vargas on the beach. Oh yeah, with the, the uh, spear gun. Yeah, yeah. the spear gun. Uh, what is it? He says. Um, I think he got the point. Uh, also, uh, when I was watching it the first time. Um, the first time Bond, well, I don't know if it's the first time. It's a later on. It's not the first time he meets Domino. He goes back um, and meets with Domino again underwater, and they have, like, this clandestine underwater meeting. And I'm like, they go behind this rock, and there's a lot of bubbles. I'm like, are they, they having underwater sex? I think they freaked underwater, and they, yeah. And, they, and I was like, <laughs> yes, yes, they do have underwater sex. And I have, I have a little uh, a bit about it in a minute. And the other thing that I had to, um, let's see, where is it uh, on my notes here? is about uh, Fiona. There's an interaction where obviously Bond takes Fiona to bed or right. our, uh, another Spectre agent uh, who uh, is responsible for uh, the kidnapping. Also, we didn't mention of uh, Paula, the kidnapping, torturing oh, of Paula yes. at uh, Palmyra. But uh, he, he takes her, Jimmy beds her, and then there's a part where she kind of uh, betrays him, of course, like, you know, and, and uh, pulls, uh, you know, uh, I guess, kind of pulls a fast one on him and they, they, they try to take him out. And uh, he's like, oh, I, I banged you for king and country. My dear girl, don't flatter yourself. What I did this evening was for king and country. You don't think it gave me any pleasure, do you? Like there's yeah. just like this a great That's little great. Line. like everything yeah. I did, you know, for, was for king and country. You think it meant anything to me? Exactly. <laughs> I was like, mm, I think he was still would have slept with her, even if it wasn't for King and Country James. Right. But yeah, it's like a good little back and forth. And there's there's a good little kind of scene there in the the second kind of act of this film where they they do have him kind of captured, and then there's that like uh, there's that street bomb. We're like, hey, you want a drink? <laughs> And he like slaps the mm -hmm. <laughs> slaps the rum or whatever it is onto the back of the seat and then escapes that way. Just good little good little stuff in the in the second act. And of yeah. course, like where uh, Jimmy again, uh, like uh, we were talking about last week in Goldfinger, where you get the goon in the eyes and turning the girl into the blackjack. This time it's slow dancing with Fiona and turning her into the uh, the, the gun, bullet. the yeah. bullet to the back. And then it's like you know puts her down. It's like she's just dead, you know. <laughs> Like, some good Jimmy Bond quips this it time is, around. It is. Uh, there was a couple of, uh, we haven't had them uh, a lot here, because I didn't, I didn't put in a lot of them, but uh, what we were calling double O nose. Uh -oh. These are a little goose. And there's just a couple of things that I, that I thought stuck out that I noticed while watching. Usually if I don't notice them while watching, I don't really put them in. Uh, but when James gets the gadgets, he is told that the watch was a Geiger counter and the camera would take eight pictures quickly when the button was held. Later, 007 tells Domino that the camera is a Geiger counter and will work when she presses the button. Ah. So a little continuity stuff. Pay attention, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when Bond is underwater, a diver removes his blue dive mask. He then removes a black mask from a dead diver and puts that on. In the following scene, the mask is blue again. Ah. Uh, when Bond confronts Count Lippy at the health retreat, he enters a door that has the word massage on it. When he exits the room, the door suddenly says, sits bath and heat treatment. Ooh. And uh, the last double O no here. When Bond is shot in the calf as he runs away, the blood is on the right leg. When he crawls onto the float, it's on the left. The next day, he is diving to check the plane without so much as a bandage on either leg. Man. I did notice that. The first movie where Bond gets any kind of really hurt, I would say. Yeah, he gets clipped. He yeah. gets clipped in this one. You need some Bond bits up in your time? Let's do it. All right. Uh, Bond's jetpack was actually flown by engineer Bill Souter. He was one of only two people in the world qualified to fly it. Nice. Maybe he was the one that lumped it up there. <laughs> Uh, in the other water scenes where Bond encounters sharks, Sir Sean Connery was supposed to be protected by clear plastic uh, panels shielding him from sharks in close-ups. However, the panels only extended about three feet in height, and sharks could swim over them. As a result, in some scenes, notably during the uh, the pool fight at Largo's mansion, Connery got much closer to the real sharks than he wanted. Director Terrence Young said in an interview that scenes used in this movie where Bond reacts in fright as a shark approaches were miscues in which Connery was reacting to genuine terror as a shark approached unobstructed by plastic shielding. It's not good. <laughs> not good. 
Uh, I think there was uh, something I didn't put in there, but I read it when he when they were telling uh, Sean Connery that he would be in a pool with live sharks. His response was not bloody likely. <laughs> uh, the only Bond movie where we get a glimpse of all 00 agents in one shot. They are summoned to M's briefing, and 007 is the last to join. He sits down in the only available chair, the seventh from the left. Only one of the other 00s is revealed. However, they are filmed from behind. Sir Sean Connery performed the gun barrel sequence for the first time because of the new Panavision process used in the movie. Nice. Beginning with this movie, the sequence will be performed by the actor playing Bond in the movie. We mentioned that the budget for uh, this film was more than the combined budgets of the first three Bond movies. The definary, di- definary, the dictionary definition. <laughs> I made a new word there. The de- the definary time. I like it's it. It's the it's definition and dictionary together. Let's put. Let's use it. Yeah. Uh, The dictionary definition of the word thunderball is a a military term used by U.S. soldiers to describe the mushroom cloud seen during the testing of atomic bombs. Hence, it's used as title because this would be the result of Spectre detonating the stolen atomic bombs. Nice. Uh, The uh, the character of Count Lippy is a reference to Ian Fleming's old friend from his days as an intelligence officer, Prince Bernard of the Netherlands. Bernard was born as Bernard von Lippy Blesterfield. He was very pleased by the reference. (laughs) <laughs> uh, the line where Fiona derides Bond's ability to turn women to the side of right and virtue was taken from a critique of Goldfinger where the critic derides Bond's ability to turn pussy galore away from Goldfinger oh. and away from pussy. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, <clears throat> the girl with whom Sean Connery was dancing when Bond was escaping f- uh, from Fiona also appeared in Casino Royale playing poker with Daniel Craig. She was the wife of Huntington Hartford II, whose estate in the Bahamas appeared in both films. Oh, shit, that's cool. Uh, let's see. Claudine Augers' heavily accented English was deemed too French thick by the filmmakers after shooting initial scenes of her. Nikki Vanderzeel, who dubbed Ursula Andress's voice in Dr. No, was brought back to dub Augers' lines. For similar reasons, Adolfo uh, Sell or Selly Largo had his lines dubbed over by Robert uh, Rietti. I think is his name, to hide his thick and distinctive Sicilian accent. <laughs> Got to do this. Again, you know, you wouldn't if you didn't know it, you wouldn't know it. Yeah, exactly. I really, I, there was one point when I was listening to Domino talking, I was like, man, that sounds a lot like Ursula Andrews. And then I was like, oh, well, she's dubbed. Ursula Andrews was dubbed. Okay, there's no one that uses their actual, <laughs> except Sean Connery. Except Sean Connery. I don't buy anyone's voice in these movies anymore. <laughs> Um, and the last thing I had here, by the time of production in 1965, the popularity of the James Bond film franchise has resulted in, plur- in a plurifer, ugh, can't talk, in a uh, plurifer, <laughs> Ple- plethora, a pleth, no, it's a pl- <laughs> placebo, <laughs> artichoke, <laughs> Proliferation is okay. what I'm trying to say here of other espionage movies and television series. As a nod to this trend in popular entertainment, during the meeting of the double O agents in M's office, the plan was originally to have the stars of other spy related entertainment appear as their popular characters Robert Vaughn and David McCollum from The Man with Uncle, James Coburn from Our Man Flint, Sir Michael Caine as Harry Palmer, Dean Martin as Matt Helm, Robert Culp. And Roger Moore? No. No. <laughs> Bill Cosby. Oh, from I Spy. I Spy. You see, double O seven. You see what it was. You got to put the pills in the paper. <laughs> you got to put them in it, Jimmy. <laughs> if you really want to get Domino where you want Domino. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, got, you got to pack a pass out. <laughs> and you can put your pudding pop inside <laughs> Can't come back. And this is where we're canceled. This is this my, is the last one, folks. We've enjoyed it, folks. It was a Bill Cosby that got us in the end. We never even got to the Roger Moore era. Yeah, we'll never, <laughs> we'll never see the Moore era between me not being able to talk, uh, my pussy galore joke, and now this. Uh, and now the Cosby. And reference. now the Cosby reference. Uh, we're done. We're done. We're done. Uh, before we move on to uh, the reviews and final thoughts, Todd, there is a big elephant in the room we didn't mention. It's a little film called Never Say Never Again. Ah, okay. We are aware of it. I don't want to go into it now. I want to give it its own episode and its own thing. Exactly. But if you don't know what Never Say Never uh, Again is, it's a movie by a guy who thinks Never Say Never and Thunderball are the best. <laughs> it's the best Bond story ever right. made. So he wants to recreate it. Every movie is Thunderball. Right. That's basically what it is. We'll get 
meaning to never say never again. Uh, it's the only thing. I just don't want people to think like, oh, they didn't mention never say never again. We're aware of We're it. Aware We're aware of it. We're going to give it its due in time. Trust me. Uh, so, Todd, any final thoughts and your review for uh, Thunderball? Uh, Thunderball is still a good Bond film. Uh, there are many others in this series that I would pick Thunderball over. I just think that it's a matter of once you've peaked – and that peak is Goldfinger. <laughs> Unfortunately, the only direction left to go is you're starting to slide down. Uh, in my opinion, Thunderball is still a solid outing for 007. It's just some things don't quite do it for me here. I give Thunderball a 7, which is good. Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the least watched Sean Connery Bond films for me, one of the ones I go back to the least, I kind of watched the first three, skip to Brosnan. <laughs> skip to Craig. That's kind of my order for right. my Bond films. I kind of skip over a lot of more. And I skip over Dalton, but not that I, I don't like the Dalton films. But again, this is, it just, it feels a little bit off from what came before. It's not, it never reaches the heights of any of the three that have came before it. It doesn't, it doesn't touch a Dr. No. It doesn't touch a From Russia with Love. And it definitely doesn't get to the heights of a Goldfinger. But as you said, still a solid Bond film. I can't really, uh, you know, say too much more about it than it's just kind of solid. It has its problems, but it's still a solid Bond film overall. Uh, I give Thunderball a 7 out of 10, which ranks it as good. All right, Ty, tell everyone how they can find us and stay up to date with us on social media. We are at Tau Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, Tau Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at TauCapesPod at gmail.com. Uh, if you enjoy the show, please consider following us on your podcast platform of choice uh, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. We want to thank you so much for listening. Popcorn Mumbles will return next week. Until next time, bye, guys. See you, guys.